Did I mention that I like survey data, especially in the context of electoral forecasting? Eh, probably not, because I'm a pretty shy and reserved man. Why? Why are you laughing? Yeah, yeah, that's true, I'm not that shy. But I did mention my interest for electoral forecasting already on the show. And before doing a full episode where I'll talk about French election, yes, that will come at one point, let's talk about one of France's neighbors, Germany. Our German friends had federal elections a few weeks ago, consequential elections, since they had the hard task of replacing Angela Merkel after 16 years in power. To talk about this election, I invited Markus Gross on the show because he worked on a Bayesian forecasting model to try and predict the results of this election, who will get elected as chancellor, by how much, and with which coalition. I was delighted to ask him about how the model works, how it accounts for the different sources of uncertainty, be it polling years, unexpected turnout, or media events, and of course, how long it takes to sample. I think you'll be surprised by the answer. We also talked about the other challenge of this kind of work, communication. How do you communicate uncertainty effectively? How do you differentiate motivated reasoning from useful feedback? What were the most common misconceptions about the model? That kind of stuff, right? Marcus studied statistics in Munich and Berlin and did a PhD on survey statistics and measurement error models in economics and archaeology. He worked as a data scientist at INWT, a consulting firm with projects in different business fields as well as the public sector, and now he's working at Flix Mobility. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 52, recorded November 3, 2021. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.com. That's learnbayesstats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. hey folks before listening to marcus i want to warmly thank all the new members of the lba's patreon especially those in the full posterior tier or higher this time i'm talking about the tremendous ryan wesleyn andreas netty riley king and aaron jones your support helps me pay for editing, manage the community, and, well, just improve the show in general, which I'm sure you are all in favor of. So I am very grateful for your support. Okay, now let's talk electoral forecasting with Marcus Gross. Marcus Gross, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah. You bet. Always a pleasure to talk about electoral forecasting. Mm -hmm. And I have the feeling I could have invited you before because now the German election is over. But it's actually interesting to take stock of, of models once the election is over. And now, actually, we're going to have the ability to talk about, okay, what happened before the results, what happened after. So I'm actually glad we're doing that now. Okay. But... As always, let's start with your background. Who are you? 
Marcus, how did you end up in the stats and data world? Yeah, I yeah, as I was in school, I just yeah had some affinity to mathematics and especially stochastics. And then I found out that there's a, like a field called statistics at the universities, and this is pretty unknown in Germany. So in the Anglo-Saxon countries, USA and UK, for example, statistics is quite common actually. But in Germany, if you talk to somebody that you could could study statistics, that was pretty much unknown and as I when hmm. I started back then like data science was not something it was like pretty much in maybe in the early stages or something and yeah I looked into it and I found it pretty interesting like the all the problems you could solve and especially that you could apply statistics in like in any field at university but also in business and this was really driving me into it yeah okay that's funny that, that you'll say that because that's a bit of the same situation in France, I'd say. And statistics has been, like, has picked up since. But I guess, you, I did my, my graduate studies in the early 2010s. And so data science was not, was starting to pick up, but not the huge thing it is right now. And, and yeah, I, I remember that when I first started studying statistics and, and even Python, like no Python, I, I don't have to explain what this is to non nerdy uh, people. Mm -hmm. But before I had to, like I was saying, okay, so Python is using these these cases on these websites, blah, blah, blah. Whereas right now, most, most people know what Python needs. It's quite funny to have seen that, that uh, popularity peak, peaking yeah. up. Was it the same in Germany? Yes, we all started with R. Right, and then uh, Python came more and more popular, and uh, like in the, I would say since 2014 or 2015, it became much more prevalent in the data science scene, and also a bit with statistics. I like both. I use both for different projects, so I'm I'm really familiar with both. I'm not really uh, saying that one of the both is better in general than the other. Like for data science or statistics, both have their yeah, advantages and disadvantages. So it depends. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, clearly. I can, can guess that. And so you basically were drawn to statistics very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't seem to have meandered a lot in your path. Am I right? That's right. I had some side courses at university and I just uh, had a bit of a feeling of other fields then. But yeah, it was pretty much straightforward. Yeah. It was not much about data science back then, as I said, but it's more like my interest was in statistics. And then I pretty much everyone who started with me in statistics, uh, we got into data science and are now part of it. But I also like the, the say, the foundations, like the theoretical and mathematical foundations. I think they are very important. And I think you can, statistics is a field or data science is a field where you can do a lot of things wrong. So I think it's very useful to have a, solid background, solid foundation in the, in the mathematics and statistics. Mm -hmm. And do you have any particular area of statistics and mathematics you are fond of and interested in? Because these are huge, huge uh, fields. So of course you cannot be, uh, you cannot be an expert and, and familiar with, with all the dimensions. Yeah, sure. Um, in the last years, I got more into Bayesian statistics. And mm -hmm. in Bayesian statistics, I had a lot of projects at the in my PhD, for example, in a measurement error model, when you cannot measure what you actually want to measure, but you measure something which is, has some error in it and you don't have the true values and you try to fit a model around this and try to incorporate the measurement error that it doesn't make your predictions or make your uh, inferences worthless. This is a big field that, which I'm into. In. Yeah, and I'm guessing that's what, that's what, attracted you to Bayesian stats, right? This ability to estimate measurement error and to incorporate that into your models? It's basically that augmentation. And this is also the, the way I came into Bayesian statistics because I had a project uh, where we had a lot of uh, measurement error and different uh, variables or features. And mm -hmm. yeah, I researched a bit and um, the Bayesian approach of data augmentation that you see or regard the true values of the of your features as uh, additional parameters. So you have the true value, which is a parameter to yeah estimate actually. And this approach was really like made sense to me, and I followed this approach and came into Bayesian statistics in, in that way. 
more or less. Yeah. Amazing, I love that. And I basically have the same story with Bayesian stats, actually. Like, uh, really starting with electoral forecasting and then discovering that what I'm interested in is, is not only estimating the mean, but estimating the full distribution mm -hmm. of scenarios and, and the uncertainty and all that, and digging and then coming to Bayesian stats and then PyMC. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> this is awesome. I gotta do that right now. And, and the rest is history, as they say. So, so yeah, basically the same, the same story. And I remember I was amazed at this ability to add measurement error in the mm -hmm. model. And, and just this beauty of one of the most important principles in Bayesian stats is if you don't know something, put a distribution around it. Yeah. And so measurement error is like that. It's, you imagine that it's super complicated to add that in model, and then you discover, oh no, to set a prior around your data and you're done. <laughs> Is it like, really? Where's the tree? Uh, yeah, I, I completely understand. Yeah, I, it's really. Yeah, I mean, like things like measurement are really complicated, like to have, like to incorporate like a maximum likelihood model or something. And yeah. in the Bayesian statistics, you can just write it down sometimes, uh, like depending on your framework, but sometimes you just write it down and it works. So this is quite like really nice. So yeah. <laughs> Definitely. And so how would you define what you're doing nowadays? Yeah, nowadays I'm mostly into yeah data science. I'm not so much into data engineering, but rather the but rather the like, actual modeling. So mm -hmm. I do understand all these all these frameworks, but I'm more thinking about how to yeah, from a business perspective, how can the data be used, what to do with the data, what kind of model where do you have to pay attention where could be uh, potential problems be and depending yeah what you want to achieve like maximum predictive power or some insights into the data i yeah i develop models we implement them into production with our data engineers and yeah that's basically it otherwise i also work as a side project i work um on a shiny apps like web applications that incorporate like modeling online where you can just upload data and then you can fit also basic models in it. These are some geospatial models which you can just fit online and display them, see the graphs, export and so on. So this is basically what I'm doing right now. I see. Yeah. And so from what you say, your, your preferred patient workflow is in R. And so I'm guessing Stan? Yeah, Stan. It doesn't make really a difference if you use R or Python. You just have to yeah, format your data in, it in the right format such that Stan can use it. But I mainly work in R with Stan. Yeah. 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 But somehow there is a high correlation if you're using R. Probably you're using, using Stan. There is a high correlation. I, 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 I haven't tried PyMC yet. All the Stan people say, okay, Stan is a bit better actually, but I'm really not. I should try it. If you can recommend it. Um, I, I would, would be eager to try it and uh, maybe test the same models on uh, different frameworks to just yeah, better get a feeling what is better in which situations and so on. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sure. And I actually have an electoral forecasting model. I'm working on it mm -hmm. right now, but hopefully it will be done. Sure. Famous last words, electoral forecasting model for French elections mm -hmm. using PyMC. So maybe that, well, that, that should be of interest to you. Sure. Let me know if you, when you can uh, present something or GitHub yeah. repository or something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll let you know. For now, I have a huge pull request with uh, way too many commits on it. <laughs> so it's really not something you want to look at. And I'm wondering in general, how Bayesian is your, is your work actually? Because you work in a company. So yeah, how much, like what's the proportion of topics you have that are where you get to fire the Bayesian framework and mm -hmm. other topics where you don't? I would say it's 90% uh, non-Bayesian and 10% uh, Bayesian. So maybe the, maybe that's the proportion of just statisticians in the world, 10% are Bayesians. Yeah, sometimes in business you just throw like a gradient boosting model on some data or something and then that's it. There's no need sometimes to just use Bayesian models, but sometimes applications, for example, yeah. I had some months ago an A-B testing project uh, where we had a like custom implementation of A-B testing for a customer. And yeah, so I propose to use yeah, Bayesian modeling because then uh, you can easily, more easily derive uncertainties, probabilities, uh, which one is better and so on. But yeah, mostly it's non-Bayesian actually. Yeah. 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 A-B tests. 
perfect setting for the Bayesian mm -hmm. for Bayesian stats, and also because you can do A, B, C, D, E, F, G tests if you want, and that's not a huge uh, headache as it is in the in the classic framework. Right. So definitely, and yeah, I can testify, build a company around that <laughs> a lot of times. You can use Bayesian stats in industry, and let's talk actually about the, about your model now. So you built a model with, I guess other contributors that you can you can cite here for the 2021 20, for the 2021 German federal elections so before diving into the model how did this project come into being and why did you start working on electoral forecasting yeah i was in 2016 i was in the us usa and i followed the election back then and yeah, I, then I saw like the, all the election models, like from 538 or the New York Times. And I wondered why such things that don't exist in Germany. And I had the idea to just, yeah, also uh, create a model for Germany, because I think this is a really interesting topic where you can like use Bayesian statistics or sorry, where you can just take publicly available data and then fit like pretty complex model on it and yeah I think I just tried it on the, the German poll data and yeah in 2017 we had a first project on it it was not non-Bayesian it was frequentistic and there were several models which were like one model for the uncertainty and one model for the mean prediction and so on and afterwards I thought okay it somehow worked but it's much nicer to have it all in one to have a model that estimates everything at the same time that gets the uncertainty so I started to de develop a Bayesian model after the 2017 election. Yeah, and then I followed this project. Yeah, I de tried different approaches, developed the model further and further. And in 2019, I was at the StunCon. This is uh, yeah, just a, a conference for Stun where I presented a preliminary model. And yeah, last year in 2020, we decided to make a project in our, my um, previous company. ENVT statistics and uh, yeah, such that we create a full web page where you can follow the results every day, yeah, predictions every day. And uh, yeah, we uh, started at the beginning of this year where we published our website. The model was finished like in one year ago, like in end of 2020. Yeah, and that's basically the story behind it. So I <laughs> wanted to have a forecasting model on elections for Germany. Yeah. Yeah. But why? <laughs> so that's funny because I have I have a very similar trajectory and started actually going into patient stats because I was interested in, in electoral forecasting. And somehow five years almost five years later, this project is still with me, although I've grown into other topics and, and fields, but Weirdly, this, uh, this first project and these electoral forecasting models stick with me like a virus. Mm -hmm. And I think I have understanding of some of the reasons why, but I want to hear your reasons why, because you've worked on that for five years now almost, right? Like me. And so I'm, I'm wondering why you keep getting interested in, in this model. Because from the outside, you could, we could think, okay, you did one model for one election. Now maybe you're interested in something else, mm -hmm. but no, you kept with it and it's the same country, it's the same parties and so on. So what's interesting to, what's the need for you? Yeah, the, I think the interesting part of it is that this is like a topic where everybody can identify with. It's not something you can have a very cool model on a on field or a data which nobody's really interested in. But this is data everybody knows, like everybody follows the polls, everybody follows the elections. So it's relevant for everybody in the country. Yes. And this is, yeah, this is nice because you can can combine statistics and Bayesian modeling with a really relevant topic. This is the major take here, I think. And also for my uh, previous company, it was a really nice showcase. So starting with, yeah, developing a model, then implementing this model, developing a web page where you have all data and predictions available and make it transparent, creating a GitHub repository and so on. It's the relevancy, I think, for the public and in combination with the, yeah, like sophisticated statistical modeling. I think this is the main point here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the website, by the way, the web page is really good. I, I love it. Like the, the visualization are really sleek. Thank you. And, um, 
I find, I find that super, super nice, really well done. And yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And, and in fact, I think something I like is a paradoxical point that you want to tell people that it's better to trust the model than just the raw polls, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't trust the model too much. And so I love making that point because it just makes everyone confused because You've got these kind of extreme reactions to models. It was the same thing for models during COVID. So either people don't believe it at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's all garbage and we don't know anything and we're all Jon Snow. If you want. Or like, no, models are awesome and we should completely believe them and we should buy completely into them. And so you've got this kind of pretty huge standard deviation on the reactions and not really something in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so that's something interesting to me to understand why first. I think one of the reasons is that we just our brain just doesn't like uncertainty too much. And also then try to explain to people that um, it's not because a model is not 100% trustworthy, that it's 0% trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And that's weird because it's it's not a very deep point, but it's weirdly a point that you have to make yeah. over and over again. Yeah, I think these two poles, some people just ignore the uncertainty and take the uh, predictions as, as, they, as they see it. And other people say, okay, there's large uncertainty, so it's useless. In the end, it's uh, between these uh, both uh, things. And uh, it's hard to communicate uh, this to people like uh, that it has some uncertainty and the uncertainty is quite large actually in many cases but it still is somehow useful yeah this is the hardest thing to communicate actually yeah the major yeah yeah and that's why to me it's also interesting it's because the statistical challenge is very it's, it's fascinating and that's why this is noisy data with complex social economic interactions mm -hmm. that make the the latent variables very interesting and hard to estimate so the statistical challenge is very interesting first for you as a modeler but it doesn't stop there and the, the the visualization and the communication challenge is almost as big as the modeling challenge actually because you can have a really good model but if you cannot help people see the difference with a simple poll aggregation then probably there something went wrong somewhere and so that that challenge is very interesting too and and to me at least for me harder than the statistical challenge yeah. itself you have to be very careful what you communicate how you describe your results yeah. and how you don't want to be like superficial but at the, uh, but not too complex in your in your how you communicate uh, or your model basically and your predictions yeah yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the use of, you know, statistical lingo and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. It's quite hard. Like, I love HDI, but I cannot say the 94% HDI stat. And so that's uh, <laughs> frustrating. <laughs> but that's a good challenge. Actually, I'm wondering how much time did the model take to develop from start to finish? I think the Bayesian model was about two years, but I didn't, of course, work all the time on it. But like when I had some time, some free time, or then I worked on it and improved it regularly all in all i would say maybe two months uh, full time yeah it was quite a lot of work because it's if you the model was is quite complex in the sense that it's really going deep into several hierarchical levels when it was i had really large problems how that it would fit actually with it's done and to make it fit to reparameterize my model and so on so this was one major point here and of course, uh, trying out different approaches, different model formulations, which worked better on forecasting previous elections. And yeah. Yeah. And surely how long does it... It depends on how much iterations you run, but we chose to update... Sorry, there's just some noise. I don't know if you hear this. No, I think it's okay. okay. Then I... Re how much time uh, does it take to sample? But, uh, in our project, we wanted to have daily updates such that we decided to don't run that many samples. In the end, it uh, takes about 15 hours uh, to sample. But of course, if I would, yeah, had the choice, it would be like a bit more like uh, maybe 24 to 26 hours to have more iterations and get a more, get a better approximation or a better, better result actually. So this was like something we had to make a compromise here hmm. that we could uh, yeah. Yeah, give daily updates on the web page. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because if the model takes 26 hours to run, then daily updates are a bit... Uh, maybe on another planet, you can do that. Uh, but on, on Earth, it's a bit yeah. hard. And so uh, was the sampling time mostly driven by 
by the size of the data or because of the random walk because you use a multivariate Gaussian random walk so that's a lot of parameters especially if you do that for all the previous elections so what was driving driving the the, the sampling time not actually the, the random walk itself because it's not a classical random walk so it's I'm not I should go as deep into it right now but it's not a yeah, yeah, sure. yeah it's not a classical random walk but it's like an adjusted random walk where you because I found out or that on if I fit a random walk, it doesn't really the data doesn't really follow a random walk. What you have in the end is that the long term variance of your party vote shares is uh, smaller than you would walk, and it's uh, the party le uh, vote shares are much more stable long term. There was like another step of part from the random walk where you had these auto regressive processes where you had a kind of a diminishing effect on how each shock, so in a random walk you have, you can say, okay, you have some shocks in the vote share and the shocks, yeah, have a peak after four or five weeks and then they diminish somewhat so that mm -hmm. you have a much more stable uh, vote share long term. And what takes the most time is the hierarchical structure. So you have the poll and then you have the two vote share. And how you get from the two from the poll to the two vote share or the two vote share estimate is like several steps are involved. So you just what are you saying? The two vote share. The two vote What's share. That? So the the poll isn't the two vote share. So the two vote share at some point t, right? Suppose you are in uh, week two, two thousand twenty one, and mm -hmm. the the two vote share I define as the what would be the uh, vote share of a party if the election would held would be held in this week, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So the latent. The latent. Okay. And to come to this uh, latent uh, variable from the yeah poll, you have to uh, make several steps. You have the yeah poll results, and then you each poll has a kind of a bias. So, uh, for example, polls the A always overestimates party B, for example. So historically, you mean like Histo a historical yes, bias? Yes, historical yeah. bias. It's not. It's not what's called the house effects, which are the. the Okay, not the bias, but the tendency of some pollster to overestimate or underestimate some parties during the election cycle because they depart from the average. Yes, actually, my model has two uh, kinds of housing effects. So one is the long term housing effect and uh, the second one is short term house effect, which is uh, like within an election cycle. And okay, so the, what you call the long term house effect would be the bias? Yes. Yeah. And you can a house effect is bias. Yeah, in, in the literature, it's not. Yeah, but yeah, yeah I agree. It's like a house effect is almost a bias, but the, like by definition, it shouldn't be the bias because you don't know the the election results yet. Yeah, sure. And you so you have the long and short term house effects. Like the long term house effect is the bias, and the short term house effect is only within election cycle. Yeah. And yeah. then okay, if you look at the previous elections, there were always. Some cases where all polls that were off, like they all overestimated some party by a certain amount mm. of yeah vote share, and and this is actually quite surprising. So or not surprising, but actually you see when this happens that the polls are not independent. There's a common polls ever I would say they tend to overestimate and or underestimate a party together at the same time. And this this common bias, common polls bias, is something. That you cannot know in, in, in advance, yeah. So it's yeah. yeah distributed around zero, but this is something which is in the way or in the uh, process of getting rid of all the effects uh, to go from the polls the polls results to the two latent votes here. And then you have the you got rid of the bias in the model, and then uh, you have all these like diminishing short and midterm effects where you have these uh, shocks and which uh, yeah diminish over time and then if you subtract these effects then you get to the true vote share so you have several levels of hierarchy and this is a state space model and this these kind of state space models are notoriously hard to fit except you have mm -hmm. a you apply a Kalman filter or something which is like really basic but in, in this case it wasn't possible so it's like very custom and in this case it's really hard to fit for any kind of modeling framework yeah. Okay, that's super interesting. And so you're talking about the hi different hierarchies. Mm -hmm. What are those? So is it that that the uh, state level and then the whole national level, or uh, how does it work? No, not in the, that sense. It's more what I just explained that you that you 
have the two latent voce and you add specific items to it such that you arrive at the poll pollster results which you can observe. Okay. So between you want yeah. the things you want to measure, the latent two voce and the pollster results, there are different steps where you add house effects, biases, and yeah. all these kind of time series effects which I mentioned earlier. So yeah. this is a lot of between steps that the model mm -hmm. has to Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see. But I love that because you can really relate that to the domain knowledge. Like you can really like your model is telling a, a narrative, a story about how you come to observe the poles, mm -hmm. and those poles that you observe actually come from a latent structure that right. you never get to observe, but that's there in the world. You just don't see it because you're not omniscient, mm -hmm. but it's there. And, and you've got this story in your model that tells, okay, I think that's how it works. Yeah, exactly. And that's how we come to observe the poles that we do observe. Yeah. You can also translate this into different like uncertainty effects. So you have the uncertainty yeah. about your, your future events. You don't know about future events. These are shocks. You don't know the, the direction. You don't know the size, but you can form a distribution around it. The use size is around this and this. And yeah, you can uh, impose a multivariate normal or multivariate T distribution on all your parties. And then the second level of uncertainty is the uncertainty in polling. So as I said, you have the polling uncertainty of a specific pollster, then the polling uncertainty of a specific pollster for a specific party, and the common bias of all pollsters for a specific party. So you have different, say, levels of uncertainty here. And you have to incorporate all of them into your model such that it gives uh, like useful results and it doesn't mm. underestimate the uncertainty. Yeah, it's crazy how relatively simple observations that are polls are asking for complex models to to account for all the different effects that you have in the campaign. And OK, so you've got one time series per party in the end, which is like trying to infer the true latent mm -hmm. uh, party support for each party. And each of these time series is related to one another through the covariance matrix of the multivariate random walk. Yes, right. right. And then you've got your your likelihood, which is probably a multinomial in the German setting. I tried it, but I didn't use this kind of approach. But I what I use is I use the log transformation on the uh, watch. Oh, okay. So you use a multivariate Gaussian random walk likelihood. A multivariate uh, multi uh, Gaussian likelihood. A multivariate Gaussian likelihood, but the like the shocks in the random walks uh, or the steps in the random walks are multivariate T distributed. Yeah. It doesn't, if you look at the model formulation in the stand file, for example, it's not that obvious because of reparameterization that, but it's actually, it's a T distribution inside mm -hmm. of the model. Yeah. Okay. So like your, your likelihood is a multivariate Gaussian, then you've got the late, the latent party support, which is a multivariate Gaussian random walk. And to that, you add shocks that are multivariate student T distributed. Yes, the, the reason is if you follow the vote share of a party, you can do this like by, by the Pulitzer results, for example, that you can just plot in time. And then you see most of the time doesn't happen anything. And then uh, suddenly there's some large shifts in the vote share. And if you do model this with a Gaussian distribution, you this doesn't really fit it very good because... You, yeah, it's not, it has really long tails. So sometimes there are really mm -hmm. large shifts, which, which cannot really be explained with the Gaussian distribution to better model like these large unexpected shifts. I, I used a T distribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm curious about the, so before we get into that, thanks for that conceptual overview of the model. And you're the thing you want to you wanna add to that or you think uh, listeners will get a good idea of the conceptual building blocks of the model? This is a good overview of the building blocks of the model, but it's important to know that there are actually two parts of the model. So this is uh, the first more complex part, but there's a second part where we not only want to predict uh, the vote share, but also to predict the probabilities uh, that a certain party gets into the government, that yeah. a, a certain uh, person gets a chancellor in Germany and so on. So f for that, we had to model coalitions. And coalitions are yeah. something, for example, they don't exist in the US, but in Germany, where you have a multi-party system, like more than two major parties, parties get together to get a majority in the parliament. And uh, coalitions can be two parties or three parties or even four parties. And for a given voting result, yeah, for a given election result, it's not really clear, yeah, how's the government constituted in the end. 
So mm -hmm. it could be, the, be either a party A and C or party B and C, which both have a majority in the parliament. And um, to account for this and to give more, this is also, of course, of interest for the reader or for uh, the people, you want to know who is the government after the election. And to model this, we asked experts and they should rank potential coalitions and they should rank them so such that the ranking is independent of the voting result. So they should imagine of a situation where you people of a party of all parties you uh, put into a room and they had to, they should have the goal to yeah create coalitions and like find together and then you the experts had to say okay who do you expect to find together first and then second and so on yeah and we also employed the bayesian model here to derive predictions on that on top of the vote share model so How this works is basically that we derive, say, thousand simulations of the uh, vote share of the election result. And on these thousand simulations, we put on top the government or coalition model that gave for every of these thousand simulations also an outcome, which were then aggregated to yeah, state. How likely is it that, say, Olaf Scholz gets a counselor? Uh, what is the probability that we have a government with a Green Party and so on? I see. Yeah. That's fun. And I'm wondering, so on the vote share model, uh, you're doing out mm -hmm. of sample predictions, yeah. right? And so first, how far back in the campaign are you going? And second, did you notice a point where the out of sample predictions were basically a bit useless? And so maybe, I don't know, three months before the elections, doesn't really make sense to, meant to make out of sample predictions because the uncertainty is so huge on election day. So what was your experience on, on that front? So we did only go back like one year in our out of sample predictions. Also, we started the model, published the model at the beginning of the year, so nine months in advance about. And yeah, so what we found out is that, that our model or the, the model, you can That what we found out is that the polls, the accurate polls, are not really uh, worse than a sophisticated model when it comes close to elections. So close to the election, you have only like single digit percentage yeah, advantage over the uh, poll aggregate. But the farther back you go, the higher is your advantage because the polls are fluctuating very yeah, strongly while the model is more conservative and this conservativeness helps that the long or midterm predictions are superior compared to a simple poll aggregate. But a short term, mm. you there's something you can do. It's, it's a bit better, but not much really. And mm. we didn't go back more than 12 months because I think it's not really the interest of the public. Yeah. yeah, but that means you already have. So you have enough data to go back one year before our election day for each election. Yeah. Are all the parties always present in all elections? Because for instance, in France, you can have, so for instance, the late, the last presidential election mm. in 2017, the Green Party was not there. So you've got basically six big parties in France, including the Green Party, but it was so weak in 2017 that it wasn't even competing in the presidential election. Whereas it was there in, in 2002, 2007, 2012, and will be there probably in 2022. So I'm wondering, like, how is it structured in Germany? Like, do you have, do you always have the same number of parties there? Do the parties change? How do you handle that in the long term? model yeah the parties change of course there was not that much change in germany actually only the emergence of the like the right-wing party the okay. in like in 2013 this was a new party which came into to the other five big parties and what the model does is actually that it starts we have latent values for each party for each week from 2000 uh, from 1998 uh, to until uh, 2021 and before we just have missing values in the uh, for the AfD before it was created or something and it was basically zero before you can say okay it's it's zero percent the approach is not clear really it's it's also a problem with the polls test that you that the polls is only publish results for like larger part at one point if for example in france if your green party disappears in the polls you cannot really measure it anymore so it's it's hidden in the zones here so other parties in the polls test. it's really tricky so but we decided to have a latent value for the complete time interval for each party. So yeah, you estimate something. Zeros. Yeah, 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 basically, yes. Nice, okay. 
I see. And it's really that weird idiosyncrasies that can make you bang your hand mm-hmm. against the walls when you're modeling. And in the end, often it's a simple solution, but you, it takes some time to, to come up with it. Right. Okay. And so how do you assess your model performance both before and after the election? So before the election, when did you decide, okay, that's a good enough model, let's deploy it to production. And then after the election, how did you judge its, its performance? Yeah, of course, we made an out of sample uh, prediction with our models, like on the uh, two previous elections. And we did not only like this do this once, but uh, in time steps of one month. So we started 18 months before the election and then increased increased our training data set by one month and had an yeah, estimate based on the root mean square error as well as yeah, absolute error on the percentages of vote shares. And so we did this uh, for each month prior to election from 18 months to just before the election. And we did this for the election 2013 and 2017. And the reason why we didn't go further back, like for example, elections 2005 or 2009, is that the model took some, needed some data bef- to be fit, for example, for the common points there bias, for example, where we needed m- more samples actually, and also the house bias, which was a bit, uh, yeah hard to estimate mm-hmm. if you have little data. And then uh, we had an aggregate measure, 18 measures for 2013 and uh, 18 measures for 2017. And so we could uh, compare different models, compare how like a competitor would perform. Our competitors were, for example, like you look, you took always the uh, latest poll or you took the average of the five most recent polls so that you could compare your model performance compared to yeah the, some simple poly aggregates which are easy to uh, create. Mm-hmm. And then so that's for before the election. And now that the election has passed, how do you assess your model performance? Yeah, we did actually exactly the same. We published our results on the web page so everybody can download the CSV file and see how our predictions were in the preceding months. And uh, then we did actually the same that we say, okay, for every day we had our prediction, we compare the difference to the model to the election result. So you could just, or uh, the mean absolute error for each day, and then you can compare to the aggregate and yeah, to assess whether the model is, was any good or not. But the model performance is not, not the only one. So. Uh, like the predictive performance is not the major thing. I think the, for the model to be important or to be of yeah, relevance, but it's also the communication of uncertainty so that you can yeah. Yeah, say derive also measures like how likely is it that a certain party yes. gets into the parliament? How likely is it that party A is stronger than party B and so on? And so this gives much, much more information than a simple uh, poll aggregate, for example. Even if our model is not better than a poll aggregate, you have additional information which is yeah. useful for the you have uncertainty. Yes. You have the uncertainty estimation, you have the ability to, to generate scenarios. Mm-hmm. So it's like your coalition scenarios. Yeah. You cannot do that with the poll aggregation. And also you don't have you have the more explan- explanatory power with the model right. because you've got structure. You cannot explain how the campaign is going if you don't have a structure for how the campaign is going is usually going on. So if you don't have a model, you cannot explain that. So right. clearly without the poll aggregate with the poll aggregation, you cannot do that. Exactly. And I'm wondering is each time I work on a model, I have to deploy it into production at mm-hmm. some point. But there are often known limitations that, that I like to improve for the next iteration. And I'm wondering what would you improve today if you had time in your model? Yeah, one thing that became obvious during this election cycle or the la- like the 2021 election cycle is that there were the the variants in the sense that there were much larger swings in the vote shares than usual. So I calculated this and if you make some statistics on that, you see that the swings have almost doubled in, in comparison to the previous election during the campaign. Okay, yeah. so the campaign was more volatile. Yes. And the model doesn't really account for structural breaks or something like that. If you, if the model of the underlying structure, like the underlying process, the data generating process is behaving differently, it's always hard. Like in time series, if there's a structural break, it's hard to account for this. And we didn't really 
like make had a plan for this the variant changes that the shifts in the random walks that they are larger than before so this is something that we didn't account for and yeah i would would like to uh, make a change here so that like the more recent volatility uh, is more taken into account i also yeah try to incorporate a rating so time rating but i decide against it because it's not really a bayesian thing and many people many bayesians are against the weight in the likelihood with say you can make like an exponential decay rating of your observations so nice. that observations that are like 20 years or 15 years old are, do not count yep. that much into your likelihood but i decided against it although it does somewhat improves the estimates. But yes, this is a kind of a trade-off. Either you do something like this or you incorporate changing parameters over time, which is always yeah. making the model more complex. So it's... That's the trade-off, <laughs> yeah. But that's true. It's better to have that in the model. Like in, a, in an ideal world where you don't care about, about model sampling time, Yeah, that's always better to have that in the model. So I understand why a lot of patients are against that. But yeah, sometimes you've got to make this trade-off anyway. That's true. Another thing I would incorporate is the long-term trend of the parties. What we have incorporated is that like you have a shift, for example, a candidate is announced or there's a scandal in a party or, or something and the vote share increases or decreases by quite a bit. And what you said in short or medium term, this kind of like shift yeah tapers off and you so that in the end uh, your vote share of a part the vote share of a party is more like stay back yeah to the yeah it comes back and is more stable than implied by a simple random walk and i would go one step further and introduce a long term trend which i think could improve the results further in the sense that like what we integrated or implemented is like a short and medium trend which is about like maybe three months in um, like in time interval but uh, a long-term trend could really better account for long-term trends and yeah maybe improve the model i have to test it but still um, it could be very useful i see yeah yeah i understand that i'd have this i would have the same idea for friends i think it mm -hmm. works similarly and did you get some feedback on this model and on its impact yeah we did quite get some feedback it was really mixed so some people really liked the model and we they said okay we follow the model we had also some presentations yeah in the media as well as uh, for institutions and but other people didn't really like it that they said okay it's total garbage why do you need election forecast anyways and yep. the model does and they didn't really look into the model they said okay the model doesn't account for this and this and i said okay it does account for this and this and so the critics were sometimes didn't look at the model at all and yeah and sometimes i had some discussions with some people which like random people which were like reacting to our model so yeah, yeah. it was really mixed yeah hmm. yeah so i am happy to see that motivated reasoning is as strong in germany as in france that's all reassuring, but yeah, that's almost boring. It's almost the same critics everywhere. <laughs> so I should. So, and I was like, I was almost sure that you were going to mention people like just asking you about the usefulness of all that, which you can, but usually it's not really properly done. So I should re reformulate my question and, and say, did you get any useful feedback about the model? Yeah, we had a lot of feedback on our expert interviews and the expert model. So the government model, which tried to predict the outcome of the uh, government yeah. forming, the coalitions and so on. And we came to the conclusion that it might be better to yeah don't use expert interviews because it's really hard to get experts to do this and uh, this, the other thing is that you often get criticized because yeah how do are these experts selected it's really time consuming for us to do and sometimes you have a hard time to tell the experts how to fill out the expert interview or the expert poll the coalition ranking and that's really hard and i thought about yeah using a data-based model which is might be much less prone to criticism because you can better explain how you did it and not rely on experts which yeah which where the selection is always a bit tricky uh, and the interviews are yeah mm. not easy so that's interviews that you conducted for the second model the coalition model? yes yes okay and so what maybe quickly before because we're running short on time, but I have two last questions before the two last questions. Maybe what are, what were or are the most common questions or misconceptions 
about the model that you had to encounter? The misconception was one misconception was about what the model is trying to predict actually. So many people thought it was like not trying to predict the election itself, but rather the current state of the uh, yeah mm-hmm. vote shares of the campaign. But that's not true. So our model tries really to predict including future uncertainty because of uh, yeah, unknown events, the actual election result. So this was one misconception. And the other one was uh, yeah, trying to explain or trying to explain uncertainties and different measures of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. People had a hard time if you present like the vote share and it's for party, party A, it's between 28 and 32 percent, for example. Mm-hmm. So you have a kind of 95 percent uncertainty in the bar. And then we had an estimate, for example, on, on a candidate that, for example, Martin Schulz gets a chancellor after the election. And for example, that we would say it's 70 percent. And then the uh, people wondered why we don't have an uncertainty interval around this 70 percent. If you do the simulations, you have thousand simulations and then you create a probability for an event, for example, like party A gets more than 30% of the votes and then you get a, a certain percentage and the people didn't understand what is the difference between uncertainty and, and probability percentage because in the probability, the uncertainty is already included in, in some way. Yes, if you are 100% sure or 0%, then the uncertainty is zero. But if you say, okay, the, the probability that for event A, is 50 percent and your uncertainty is really large and yeah that, that was something uh, people always asked questions about and did not really understand often mm, okay uh, that's good to know probably something to have in mind for the next election around this is also why this is super interesting you get you get to do a lot of experiments and see what works in and what doesn't in the on the communication side yeah. okay and maybe real quick what was the main challenge you faced on this model? Like, what would you say was the most complicated things in, in this whole workflow? The main challenge for me was that I had a model in mind and to make to make it work in Stun, yeah, or to make work it in any framework. I wrote down the model and I had I needed many tries that I to reparameterize the model, to reformulate the model, and so on. That it really did did estimate and done actually so that the MCMC sampler did run through so this was the main challenge actually so I had a model in mind and you can just write it down for example and done but then always estimation is a thing if you have uh, like this hierarchical structure that it mm. um, uh, produces that it converges that it produces useful results and that you produce results in uh, yeah not in two weeks or so, but rather in uh, some hours or one day or something. And this was the really the main challenge where I spent most of the time with. Yeah, I can relate to that. That's a very classic challenge. <laughs> I have that almost all the time. Awesome, Marcus, thanks a lot. Before letting you go though, I have to ask you the last two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. So number one is if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Yeah, lately I thought about a lot about A-B testing as something where you have different alternatives, for example, different prototypes of a website and you want to find out which is the best one. And I think the current approach is really uh, short-sighted or a bit like shallow because people are trying to optimize not uh, the outcome, which is uh, like the, say, the revenue or the clicks on your website, but rather to find out which is the best alternative. And they use methods which do not really optimize or maximize this, the outcome which you are actually interested in, but rather yeah, these kind of proxies. And I think there's still a lot of work to be done and because it's really a difference if you like, for example, yeah, you have say two prototypes of a website and for a new website, you work like one year or something on it and you make an A-B test and it says, okay, the newer one is not really better than the older one. And then you just discard it. And another case would be that you, yes, just change a small button or something. And uh, yeah, this, but these kind of really fundamental different things because what you, what this implies in the future is that if you make a small change, the the small change is likely to be not really persistent over a long time. But the, if you make a strong change, it's really something fundamental where you have much more risk, but much more potential benefits. So, and I think there should be more focus on how 
to set the cutoff points when to make a decision. And these kind of decisions which are made currently are based on, say, the simple statistical tests where you just set an uh, arbitrary like limit, 5% uh, niveau or something, or you compute the probability to be best. And this is also not really uh, optimal because you always choose uh, like the confidence level or uncertainty level, not really like based on what should optimize your outcome in the long run, but rather uh, on an uh, yeah arbitrary value. And I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of work to be done and I have some ideas about it. And if I could, I would invest much more time in it because I think this is also interesting from a theoretical perspective. Yeah, really. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you seem to like the theoretical, mathematical side of things. And second question is if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? Yeah, I think it would be uh, Richard Feynman, the famous physicist. And he's, uh, I think he's, it's really, he's really both entertaining and really smart. And I think uh, he always, like, he doesn't like bullshit and he does like clear, clear structures, clear explanations. And I think this is really important if you are in uh, statistics or data science that you, don't get too much confused with the like with the small details but the first thing you have to do right is the overall structure the overall uh, thing especially when you do bayesian modeling uh, your model your fundamental model should make sense and if you yeah if you have an idea what you want to i think yeah then it, it would be really uh, cool <laughs> to talk with him yeah yeah Although, definitely yeah. awesome awesome vielen dank Markus, that was great talking with you about, about electron forecasting models. Uh, I, th I think you could tell that. Plus, I'm really into the, the model for French actions right now. So my mind is really, a part of my mind is focused on that. So that was really, really interesting and meaning to have you on the show. I hope listeners learned a lot like me and were as interested as me. As usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Marcus, for taking the time and being on this show. Yeah, thank you, Alexander. It was really nice talking to you. And I hope I could give a bit more insight into my model. And if you are further interested in yeah what we have done, you can always look at our website. There's also a lot of material on our GitHub page where you have like more insights into our model. There's a presentation, there's a paper which describes every detail of our model. So, and if you want to get give me feedback, it's also very welcome. Yeah, thank you, Alexander, for inviting me. This has been another episode of Learning Bayesian Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbayesstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true Bayesian state of mind. That's learnbayesstats.com. Our theme music is Good Bayesian by Baba Brinkman with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn base stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good base and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good base and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation.